If she gets into that car, that may be the last time you'll see Jenny. I'm McGruff, the crime dog. See those kids? Every day in this country, 60 kids. Oh, beware of ghoulies and ghosties and long-legged beasties and things that go bump in the night. <laughs> I think it's a fun place for kids. How does it feel to have kids love you? Oh, that's the nicest feeling in the world. And I love the kids, too. They're all my friends. Didn't mean to bump you there. Okay. Can I bite your head? No. <laughs> it's a pleasure to meet you, Wiley. Pleasure to meet you, too. You got it on your own there. Very good. And that was our last question. And Red Team, you are the winner. Let's hear it for the Red Team. All right. Very good. Red Team's a big winner today. Sheriff gone. Yes, Marty. I think Marty wants to be sure and mention the Mailbox Club. Oh, That's good. right, Ron. We want all the kids to ride in and join on the Mailbox Club. That's right, but there's three things they need to send us, Marty. Their name, their address, and their age. And they can join up and they can get a lot of neat stories and lessons and it'll be a lot of fun to read. Ventriloquism is arguably one of the scariest forms of puppetry, and I think I found the scariest ventriloquist dummy. Not necessarily for the design, but rather the puppeteer. Operator, may I help you? Hello, operator, can you tell me how to get Sesame Street? It's a fight out of crime. Boys and girls able to have children by about the age of 12 years of age. They deceive you the same as he's deceived you all along. Yeah. 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 Who's going to be with the children? Daddy, can we see you again? Yeah. 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 Let's just answer. Okay. Okay. Let's just answer. Let's and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. The modern art of ventriloquism is a reintention of its own original purpose. <laughs> I love jello pudding, pop. Shut up, you knucklefuck. Ventriloquism as an art form didn't start until the late 1700s as a comedy act, but not until the 1800s as a comedy act in theaters. But rather, it was a biblical practice being representative of apparent spirits of the departed, with the ventriloquist interpreting the words of the spirit themselves, which eventually became used for comedy reasons, the main joke being that one person was controlling two voices. The realism originally intended to represent the departed was used to rather create the illusion of another actor. It is often debated amongst varying interpretations of Christianity if the practice would qualify as witchcraft or not. During the vaudeville era, which spans from about the 1890s to the 1930s, it became industry standard for the ventriloquist dummies to have a fully functioning mouth, which only bettered the illusion of a second voice. But at the end of vaudeville and the beginning of cinema, the most famous ventriloquial duo of all time, Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy, rose to fame. Edgar also had another notable character, Mortimer Sneed. Edgar Bergen also passed away in 1978, meaning that he was around for the end of vaudeville, the beginning of film, and the beginning of a new era of puppetry. However, with 50s and 60s children's entertainment, string puppets became the new norm, but the success of Sesame Street in 1969 kind of led the way for shifting industry standards of characters with Muppet-like attributes, which made ventriloquism even more outdated. By the 80s and 90s, they were often portrayed in horror contexts, even in children's media like Slappy from Goosebumps or the Family Matters dummy duology of episodes. But the late Edgar Bergen actually had some involvement in the new era of puppetry, having some involvement with the Muppets, the new industry standard. His daughter Candace appeared in the first season of The Muppet Show. It's The Muppet Show with our special guest star, Miss Candace Bergen! Woo! But the late Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy appeared in The Muppet Show season two. It's The Muppet Show with our very special guest star, Mr. Edgar Bergen! Which is an interesting watch with historical contexts because it's technically a crossover episode between two puppet acts. Edgar and Charlie also made a cameo in the Muppet movie. You're not gonna believe who the winner is, folks. Oh, come now, Charlie. It's their movie. Oh, so it is. <laughs> Which it was only appropriate to include a puppetry legend in a film that broke new grounds for puppetry. So for children's entertainment, at least for what I can infer, 
what remains of ventriloquism was kind of outdated by the 50s. It was more of a talk show sketch act, which was targeted more by adults. But by the 80s and 90s, it truly went back to its roots of being representative of the departed, with the dummies often being associated in horrific contexts. Except you can only build a human out of wood so accurately that it guarantees the uncanny valley. But in the 80s, a man named Ronald William Brown began to take his rise to notoriety. Brown began to take on Christian puppetry as an entertainment for a career path, presumably being a notable local Christian talent in the Largo, Florida area. A notable enough talent to be included as a cast member on Joy Junction, an obscure Christian show for the non-profit Christian television network based in Largo, Florida. Joy Junction was a Christian game show intertwined with scripted segments of the host teaching biblical lessons. Joy Junction is a show so obscure that it's not even documented what year it came out. It's speculated to have been released in the early to mid-80s, airing for multiple years. Most of what is known about the show is from surviving TV recordings reposted onto the internet. There was some merchandise of the show, which was given out on the show, which reminded kids to put God first, and there was a song collection cassette, which apparently released in 1985, meaning the show probably came out before that cassette, but it could have also been a season one release tie-in. In fact, some ads for VHS tapes exist, but not indicating the premiere, but the VHS tapes were available through $12 donations. And you'll receive two specially selected programs on each tape, Specify whether you want Joy Duncan or Becky's Barn, and you don't have to camp out at the post office. Hey, look! It's here! This ad also ties into another highly obscure Christian lost public access show called Becky's Barn, but Becky's Barn's release date is also undetermined, so it's a dead end. The logo for the show and the synth wave for the Christian television network is another solid indicator of the consensus of the early to mid-80s airtime. The show is both rare and obscure, and the following is mostly just observations from my personal speculation and what we can infer from minimal surviving footage. YouTube user Danny D is mostly responsible for archiving a portion of the series as well as the previously mentioned Cringe Vision, who launched the show into infamy, along with other similar shows of its category, including the previously discussed Peppermint Park. Oh, look at that one! That one's really nice! Yeah! With each episode focusing on the topic of a moral, whether the moral was exclusive to Christianity or not was not an issue. Simply, the biblical connections of each lesson were applied to maintain the primary aspect of biblical conversation. The games on most instances are tied to the biblical conversation, and the guests were children, meaning they had to be both safe educational and affordable, meaning the games were very boring. Why watch moving hot dogs with words to biblical verses written on them when you could change the channel to Nick with people getting covered in slime? You know, assuming you had Nickelodeon or were even allowed to watch it considering you're stuck watching Joy Junction. But in between the game show segments, we would see the residents of the fictional western town of Joy Junction engaging in biblical conversation. The intro is also very late 70s, early 80s in sound, and is a complete ripoff of the chorus of the 1971 song Joy to the World by Three Dog Night. If someone you don't know offers you a ride, you're out of there fast. Run to a school, someone you know, or a police officer. Children, be aware. So wait, what the fuck happened to Thou Shall Not Steal? The main host was Sheriff Don, who'd introduce the guest and interlude all the sections of the show. Sheriff Don would often conversate with Whitler Dan to provide his input on the biblical topic, as well as a character who I assume was added later, Deputy Les, who served as supporting role of a conversationalist. Whitler Dan's actor David Bradley, who also played another character with minimal remaining appearances, Jungle Bob, who is a fake Australian accent and would presumably showcase animals on the show, like ferrets, my favorite jungle animal. Oh, the, the smell 
So usually he licks something before he bites. We don't Professor Claude Hopper was the mad scientist who would bring in inventions which contributed to the lesson. Papillon, a fake French artist who would illustrate the moral of the episode typically in a metaphorical context. Pastor Wilson, that role writes itself. And there were two main reoccurring soloist singers that would appear on the show named Sarah Eden and Darcy Wilson. When I began to first take a deep dive into the series, one thing that caught my attention was this Muppet character. I say Muppet because of the design's attributes. But this character, from observations of remaining footage, is presumably a lost character within a mostly lost show. It's the only Muppet character in this show, and I assume the character only has one appearance, but the scene of his appearance is used in the intro to multiple episodes. So I decided to ask Danny D if he knew about the character, and not even the largest archivist of the series know who this Muppet ripoff is. So, this is essentially a lost character in a lost show. There's also a little girl who's playing an old lady who would appear sometimes, typically if the concept's related to responsive anger. To block the sidewalk all day! Well, uh, I'm sorry, ma'am. Uh, well, uh, madame, I, I was uh, showing the uh, sheriff here how we have a close uh, relationship with Jesus Christ. Oh, come on! Get real! There were also animated segments of the character... Jot the Dot, which were repurposed Christian shorts around four minutes that were originally made from 1965 to 1974, with a brief revival that lasted from 1980 to 1981, which is a solid indicator to when Joy Junction came out, assuming the revival shorts as well as the original shorts were used throughout the show. The character kind of reminds me of Spot, the retired 7-Up mascot. Jot the Dot's animation is incredibly minimalistic, especially with the geomic simplicity of the character designs, but for random Christian shorts from 1965 to 1981, I actually expected a lot worse animation. But this brings us to the most notable segment of the show, Ron and Marty. With a ventriloquist act performed by Ron, demonstrating a father-son dynamic with Marty within the biblical conversation. The most infamous of these segments is where he talks about porn, originally uncovered by Cringe Vision. I wondered why they were doing that. Well, why were they doing it? Well, they said, Marty, come over here and take a look at our pictures. So I walked on over there and I took a look. And do you know what it was? What was it, Marty? Well, it was in Arizona, I'll tell you that right now. Ron, they were looking at some dirty pictures and they wanted me to look too. Well, Marty, what did you do? Well, I said, look, guys, I like you a lot and I want to play with you. But I can't look at those pictures. I just can't do it. Well, what did they say, Marty? They said, oh, Marty, come on. Your parents are in the house. No one will see. Well, what did you say? I said, that may be true, but I know someone who will see, and that's God. That's right, Marty. You know, that kind of reminds me of a, a verse I'm thinking of in the Bible that's found in 2 Timothy 2.22. And it says that you should run away from anything that will give you evil thoughts. And as your companions, you should have friends who have pure and clean thoughts and will only give you good ideas. Well, you know what I decided to do? What's that, Marty? I decided to turn around and go right back home. Well, Marty, I'm real proud of you for that. And some of the kids were kind of laughing at me, too. Well, that's okay, Marty. I think they will respect you for your opinion. And, you know, I'm glad you weren't wishy-washy. I'm glad you remained firm in your belief that looking at those kind of things is wrong. I'm so the show followed these game show segments intertwined with the segments of these characters. And for the standards of public access 80s Christian television, I assume it was successful because there are reports of the show being syndicated from 1993 to 2005 on other networks. And looking at old TV recordings, I think there is some evidence to back this up because I believe some segments were added later. That looks very early 2000s. And in recordings, we can also see snippets of other shows that kind of look CG. I would personally assume since it was apparently syndicated so much that there had to have been at least 100 episodes. 100 was the magic number for syndication, which mathematically allows 20 weeks worth of of weekday reruns. And if you want your show to be heavily reran to profit, you gotta have a ton of content to keep the viewers interested. Like, what's the fun in seeing the same SpongeBob episode you've already seen three times in the past month? Surely, if it was syndicated for a long time, there had to have been more than around 39 recovered episodes. 
So surely the remaining episodes, if not destroyed, have to exist in network archives? People often theorize that the master copies were destroyed, and if they still exist, they will most likely never be officially released, assuming there's even a proper IP holder for the show. And the reason why people assume it's either been destroyed or will never be released, because in 2013, Ronald William Brown was charged with possession of child pornography and conspiracy to kidnap and murder a child. So Lord Almighty cut him down. But what about in between Joy Junction and the charges? Well, in 1991, he started a business called Puppets Plus, meaning that Joy Junction probably ended before 1991. But Brown continued to make a living off of Christian puppetry, and as an entertainer, archives of his website display local Florida establishments as clients. Most of his puppetry is not documented. There's not a whole lot of pictures of him in existence. But in 1998, he was pulled over for a simple traffic violation, but it was noted that he had a pair of boys' underwear shoved in between the car seats. He was let off the hook because he was claimed it was for one of his puppets. But in his local community before the charges, I assume his reputation somewhat shifted or was at least presumably damaged. Although he was a local notable talent, talented enough to be on public access television and locally puppeteer for a living, there were also reports of Brown driving kids to church and throwing pizza parties at his house. However, no arrest or investigation was ever made because all he did was drive children and give children pizza, presumably consensually, otherwise they'd have a good reason to launch an investigation. So I guess it depended on which of his neighbors you were talking to. You were either talking about this notable local talent or this creepy weird guy. But how did Brown get caught? Well, the internet. Incorporating the internet to fulfill his horrid desires was the tragic flaw in fulfilling his plan. The man clearly had a plan, and every criminal has a motivation. Why become a puppeteer? To be around children, and an excuse to buy puppet proportion clothing which could also fit a child. Now, it's not known how or why he was brought on to the show, but it can be assumed that it was because of local talent. But he never tried to make, like, his own show or anything on mainstream television. That would be too high profile. And he never reprised his role as Ron and Marty, either. If he wanted to continue his intentions, he clearly desired a low-profile position. It's not detailed if he actually murdered or sexually assaulted any children, but he did have to be reliant on others with less of a reputation, and he found ways to receive distributed illegal material, mainly through the internet. But one of the distributors, Michael Arnett, was caught and investigation launched on his clients, one of which was Brown, who used the alias UE Lime in Yahoo chat logs. And in these Yahoo chat logs, Brown can be seen expressing disturbing fantasies of sexual assault and cannibalism of children. And I guess Brown didn't consider the possibility of tracking regardless of having an alternate alias. The UE Lime alias was also used on a gay necrophilia website called cutedeadguys.net, in which his comments are available through archives on this website. And for some reason, he put a correct state location on his profile. The online activity was deemed enough for an investigation and a subsequent arrest. Summarizing police reports and court documents upon his house being raided, large quantities of illegal imagery on any media you can imagine, books about serial killers and cannibals, a blow-up sex doll with children's clothing on it, and a journal of desires dated back to 1978 and a missing child's poster were even found in his house. Some of the children's corpses within the imagery were even identified and connected to other cases in other states. This means that the unspeakable things were most likely going through his head throughout all the appearances on Joy Junction. Joy Junction seems harmless enough, but it's not a favorable watch because knowing what what we know now, we can fill in the blanks as to what was most likely going through Brown's head. Oh, that was a great game, guys. Uh, fair, I'm glad to see you sitting there because I wanted to ask you a question. You know, you are a really great singer, you know, but I was wondering about something. Have you ever thought of giving up, you know, throwing in the towel? Well, that depends on how many times you... Do you know what it was? What was it, Marty? Well, it was in Arizona, I'll tell you that right now. Ron, they were looking at some dirty pictures and they wanted me to look too. Ronald Brown faces child porn charges along with accusations that he planned to kidnap, dismember, and eat a child. This means he'd been conducting schemes to get close to children, presumably his entire adult life. Brown received a 20-year prison sentence with 
restrictions to the internet access and heavy supervision after the sentence. Brown was later suspected of being involved in another Christian television show, TV8 Kids Fun Fest, aka Pink Morning Cartoon. To see if it was spring, everything's coming up spring. Bars go high, bars go low, bars go high, well, it's time to go. Everybody's well, it wasn't Arizona, I'll tell you that right now. But that was disproven and a coincidence. It was Ella Flowers, not Ronald Brown, but it was a reasonable thing to suspect Brown's involvement because Brown had a very high-pitched voice and women typically have higher-pitched voices, and it turns out it was a female singer. But the whereabouts of Joy Junction is entirely a mystery, and unless more copies of episodes are recovered, it's lost to the sands of time as well as pretty much everyone involved. Hence to why people often assume master copies from the syndication were destroyed, and if they weren't destroyed, they're gonna be locked up for a long time, much like how Brown was. But Marty, assuming he was confiscated by the feds, he's probably gonna be locked up for a long time too. If Marty even exists still, of course. But maybe he's hiding somewhere deep in the state of Florida. But a lot are kidnapped by strangers, or even by people they know. So write them a gruff, and teach your kids to protect themselves. Help, uh, take a bite out of crime. Mrs. Kavanaugh, this is Marty. Fine. But Mrs. Kavanaugh, I'm not going to be mowing your lawn anymore. No, ma'am. I just don't need to work anymore. So you'll have to find someone else to do your lawn. Bye.